Hello, I'm Stephen Harrison of Harvard Medical School, Children's Hospital, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Welcome to part three of this series of lectures on virus structure. In this part, we'll talk about the structure of a non-enveloped virus, uh, virus particle and its implications for the mechanism by which this sort of virus particle gets into cells. As you'll recall, viruses come in two major flavors, envelope viruses with lipid bilayers like influenza virus that was the subject of part two, and non-enveloped viruses, viruses that have a tightly fitting protein coat to protect the nucleic acid, but no lipid bilayer, uh, such as rotavirus, which we'll be talking about largely today. Rotaviruses are the cause of childhood diarrhea. They're a, a, a virus that grows in the small intestine and is the major source of um, infantile dehydrating diarrhea, which is particularly serious in developing countries. There's a recent introduction of a vaccine that may ameliorate um, the, the, the spread of this virus, which has been in recent years responsible for as many as half a million uh, childhood deaths each year. The virus particle is shown here uh, in a, uh, an electron micrograph. You'll notice that the, um, that the contrast appears to be much less than uh, in the micrograph that I show of influenza virus because this is a, a micrograph taken with a cryopreserved specimen with no stain rather than a micrograph contrasted with negative stain. We're going to be talking a little bit in the course of looking at the structure of rotavirus about how one uses electron cryomicroscopy to get three-dimensional structures of large macromolecular assemblies such as this one. I also point out on this slide that that uh, envelope viruses enter cells, penetrate cells by membrane fusion, as we discussed in great detail in the last part. And non-envelope viruses need to get in by some sort of perforation process, since they don't have a, a membrane of their own. We want to talk a little bit about what we know about the mechanism of this process in the second half of today's talk. So here's an introduction to the rotavirus particle. It's sometimes called a triple-layered particle because it has three protein layers, an inner blue layer, an intermediate green layer, and an outer yellow and red layer composed of proteins known as viral protein 2, rather unimaginative nomenclature, VP2, uh, viral protein 6, the green one, and viral protein 7 and 4, the yellow and red. The red protein is cleaved in a step that we're going to talk about a little bit to two fragments known as VP8 and VP5. And those of you who have followed the previous part may begin to see similarities as we go forward between this sort of cleavage and the kind of cleavage that activates the viral fusion proteins such as fluhemagglutinin. The particle, by the way, is about 800 angstroms uh, in diameter. So it's um, almost as large as the 1,000 angstrom diameter influenza virus particle. It packages a double-strand RNA genome. In this um, animation, uh, I show you that the virus particle, as it originally uh, leaves a cell, um, is does not have these extended spikes, but a cleavage, that cleavage from VP4 um, to VP5 and 8, erects the spikes. The spike protein is quite an unusual structure. We're going to talk about it. It's anchored in the inner layer by the yellow outer layer protein. It's the job of the outer layer to deliver the inner particle into the cytoplasm. 
the inner particle never uncoats. It has a polymerase and a capping enzyme. There are 11 segments of double-strand RNA wound inside, and the polymerase can transcribe that RNA. The capping enzyme can cap it, and the message is extruded from this so-called double-layer particle, or DLP. Now, the, this animation is not pure fantasy. It's based on detailed structural data, uh, X-ray crystal structures of various proteins in their fragments, an X-ray crystal structure of the intact DLP, and as we'll talk about in a little bit more detail, a three-dimensional image reconstruction or several different three-dimensional image reconstructions from electron cryomicroscopy, or cryo-EM for short. This represent, or this slide, shows you that recent advances in electron cryomicroscopy mean that we can now obtain density maps representing the structure with essentially the same detail that we've been able to get from X-ray crystallography of large assemblies, large assemblies um, hitherto. And so here's a comparison of the X-ray crystal structure or the density map obtained from that analysis uh, for the double-layered particle, one particular little bit of it, um, and uh, the similar density map from cryo-EM. This was done in collaboration with a colleague at Brandeis named Nico Grig Grigoriev, um, and these two members, um, Jing Zhang and Ethan Setembri, uh, of our laboratories. Now, the process by which this sort of um, analysis is carried out depends on being able to uh, suspend the particles you wish to analyze in a very thin film of vitreous ice. Ice, or a, a solution suspension, frozen so rapidly that the ice doesn't form crystalline ice and hence doesn't expand in volume and distort the solute. In the electron microscope, one is seeing a projection of each particle. And by combining data from literally thousands of such images, it's possible to obtain the sort of reconstructed view that I showed you. The single particles are randomly oriented in the vitreous ice, so one has every conceivable view, and mathematical algorithms have been worked out. You might be familiar with some of them from CAT scans, um, to determine the relative orientation of all those views and to combine the data into a picture of the three-dimensional object, or three-dimensional picture of the object in question. This obviously depends on the fact that all of the particles are identical. And so cryo-EM images of biological structures are possible when those particles are very uniform. But as I've emphasized, the um, images themselves are very noisy because of the very low electron dose that's required to avoid specimen damage. If you were to try to get a less noisy image, one with higher signal to noise, then you'd fry the specimen. And so you depend on the fact that the particles are very uniform, and in the case of virus particles, the additional huge advantage of their high symmetry that make it possible to reach the molecular resolution that I've suggested. So what we're going to focus on for today um, are the outer layer proteins and their role in delivering the double-layered particle into the cell. Remember that the outer layer proteins are VP4, which gets cleaved when this erected conformation is established to VP8 and VP5, and the yellow protein, as I called it, VP7, which locks everything in place. Now VP4, the spike protein, is actually, as you probably noticed, a, various, a very curious structure indeed. I've colored 
the VP8 part in magenta and the three different, it's a trimer as you'll see in a minute, uh, three different VP5 parts in various shades of sort of red and orange. And of course, the first thing you probably noticed even with the, the first image I showed you was this thing looks like a dimer. There are two um, uh, lobes sticking up and two ears sticking off of them. And yet I've just said to you, it's a trimer. What's going on? Well, it turns out that this is an extremely um, unusual sort of asymmetric uh, arrangement of three proteins. The bottom part, we call it the foot, as you'll see, is perfectly trimeric. The outer projecting spike has a very nice twofold axis. And one is adapted to each other, one is adapted to the other by this sort of diagonal cantilever. So if you now look, you'll see that the beginning of each protein subunit, remember that VP8 is um, uh, magenta, and I'm about to show you it's the N-terminal part, uh, is, is down here, and there are three of them. The polypeptide chain comes up, one of them quits, and the other two come on up and form these ears. Polypeptide chain then resumes, the cleavage is between VP8 and VP5, as this bean-shaped domain of VP5 and continues on back down. The third bean-shaped domain is here. And so we've lost one ear. It's almost certainly been cleaved by a cleavage here and a cleavage here, as I'll explain in a minute. And that third bean-shaped domain forms this diagonal cantilever that supports the twofold clustered spike of the remaining two. Now, already this is a pretty unusual conformation, but I'm about to show you some other gyrations that this protein appears to be able to go through. So as I said, the triptych cleavage that separates VP8 and VP5, and that probably occurs in the gut as the virus emerges by lysis of the intestinal cells that it is um, that, that it is infected or, um, or emerges by some other secretory uh, method. The actual emergence is a bit unclear. Um, the, um, the, the, the triptych cleavage then um, allows the rearrangement of this spike. The, the, um, the three protein subunits, or the outer parts of them, are probably um, more disordered uh, uh, if, if the protein has not been cleaved. And if you look in the electron microscope, you don't see any ordered parts of the uh, outer assembly. And since I've said you have to average many images in order to get a decent uh, uh, three-dimensional three representation, then if the outer part is disordered, the averaging will basically um, blur out uh, all, of the, uh, all of those elements and all you'll see is the ordered foot. So if we compare now these spike regions, which in the electron micrographs or in the three-dimensional reconstruction from electron micrographs are not quite as well ordered as the parts I showed you because of some slight flexibility as these structures stick out from the virus. But we can fit them very well with known X-ray structures. If we compare them, we see that an X-ray structure of the bean-shaped domain shows a nice dimer like this. It has some hydrophobic loops at the tips that we're going to talk about. And then a separate X-ray structure of this region yields a lectin-like domain that binds sialic acid, which is a receptor for rhesus rotavirus from which these proteins uh, in our experiments were derived. Now, um, we therefore believe that the protein which is synthesized as a monomer 
combines with the double layered particle, three of them for each of the positions on which it sits. You may have noticed that there were 60 spikes sticking out corresponding to the icosahedral symmetry and inserts and is locked in by VP7 but is flexible until triptych cleavage occurs in which case the one of the VP8s is excised and the rest of the structure reorganizes to the unusual looking spike that I've shown you. Now, as if this weren't odd enough, uh, if you make a piece of the protein that's a bit longer than the one that gave that dimer I showed you, you get this trimeric structure in which a segment of the protein that was missing from the dimeric construct is present and it is formed a beautiful trimeric coiled coil and the hydrophobic loops of the bean-shaped domain are now pointing, if you wish, down rather than up. In other words, it's as if the structure has gone from this sort of arrangement to this one. And those of you who were following some of the conformational changes of envelope virus fusion proteins may find that familiar since it's essentially um, the same kind of conformational change we've seen there. And just anticipating, we believe that indeed it is that conformational change that in this case drives not fusion, there's no membrane on the virus, uh, but drives the membrane disruption that will get the virus into the cytos or get the double layer particle into the cytoplasm. And so uh, our scheme based on this information so far is that this spike-like structure and the triptych cleavage is essential for viral infectivity. This spike-like structure uh, attaches through sialic acid some suitable trigger, and we actually don't yet know what that is, allows the VP8s, the two VP8s that are attached, to separate enough that these uh, bean-shaped domains can insert or interact with the target cell membrane through those hydrophobic loops, and then this umbrella-like folding back leads in a way that we hope to understand but don't fully yet to a disruption event that can allow the double layer particle to translocate into the cytosol. Now, uh, this list basically tells you what we're thinking, an extended intermediate form, hydrophobic loops contact the membrane, the protein folds back to the umbrella-like conformation, and there's a coupling of the fold back and the membrane to perforate the bilayer. To test these notions, we can take advantage of an extremely interesting property of double-strand RNA viruses like rotavirus, uh, which I like to call functional recoating. If you'd like to study the entry of a virus by genetic methods, by trying to make mutations that would impair entry, you have a problem on your hands because if you, how are you going to get enough of an entry incompetent virus to study in the first place. You can get around that problem with these viruses in quite a clever way. If, if you take double layered particles prepared by removing the outer shell, VP7 and VP4 or VP8 plus VP5 from virus part, infectious virus particles, the double layer particle is no longer infectious because it can't get in. But if you recoat it with recombinant proteins, recombinant VP4 and recombinant VP7, and then treat with trypsin to cleave and activate the VP4, you get perfectly infectious particles. This is a process worked out 
mimicking some experiments originally done by Kartik Chandran and Max Nybert on Rheovirus by Shane Trask and Phil Dormitzer. As a result, we can use this trick to do two things. First, we can mutate the hydrophobic loops and ask, does the virus get in and if it, or infect? And if it doesn't, um, what sort of properties does it have? And second, as you'll see, we can use the, um, this scheme actually to watch virus particles getting into a cell. And so some experiments carried out by Irene Kim, a graduate student, showed that if you mutate the hydrophobic residues, you lose infectivity, the virus becomes engulfed in the cell, it's taken up by a process I'm about to show you, uh, but never infects. And you can also show that it never disrupts a membrane because the virus can allow a toxin called alpha sarsen to get into the cell, sort of sweeps it in, so to speak, if it is actually infectious, if it actually um, uh, perforates some sort of endosomal membrane, but the hydrophobic uh, uh, loop mutations uh, not only block infectivity, but block the capacity of the virus to sweep this toxin into the cell along with it. And so uh, that those, those experiments uh, are strongly consistent with the view that the hydrophobic loops matter. But in order to understand more of this process, we really got to understand more about the compartment uh, that the virus arrives in when taken up in a cell, about the kinetics of those events, and, um, and, and about other characteristics, so that we can try to figure out how to design experiments to look uh, at these subsequent steps. In order to uh, describe the experiments um, that, that, um, that, that we've devised to try to do this, I should mention the outer shell protein VP7, the other partner here, which as you see from these images and from the animation uh, early in this lecture, locks the spike protein which we believe to be the membrane perforator, so to speak, into the particle. VP7 is a trimeric protein, and it's held together by calcium. There are two calcium ions that the X-ray crystal structure showed us uh, uh, hold the protein subunits together, or there, there are um, negatively charged residues um, interacting with those calcium uh, ions so that the, the ligation of calcium is critical for the stability of this trimer. As a result, we believe that some sort of calcium withdrawal may be part of a triggering signal, but um, we have as yet to, um, to define that uh, more precisely. So in order to try to understand what's going on, We've taken advantage of the recoating experiment in a different way. We've found, or Aliyah Abdul Hakim in the laboratory has found that one can label with a fluorescent dye each of the components of the particle before recoating, that is, the double layered particle VP7 and VP4 with distinct fluorescent dyes, and therefore follow not only the binding and entry of the particle into the cell, but can detect the point at which the double layer particle is released into the cytosol, as I'll show you. So here's an experiment with VP7 um, pseudo-colored in red, the, the fluorophore on VP7, and the double layer particle in green. The experiment is done by looking uh, at the very thin edge of an epithelial cell in culture so that you can look at the top surface without much aberration. And as you'll see, the particle in the circle will suddenly release um, and um, fly around in the cytoplasm. If you look closely, you can probably see a trace of red 
remaining in the circle. This uh, experiment in which the three, um, the, th the three components have been labeled separately uh, is a little easier to follow. I'll go back uh, and show you that this particle uh, suddenly releases. And if you look at the circles, you'll see that there's still some purple, that is VP4 and, and uh, VP7, or rather VP5, VP8 plus VP7, um, at, the, at the site of entry. And the, um, we stopped the frame as the double layer particle was diffusing around rapidly in the cell after release. A summary of what we think these images are telling us might be roughly as follows. One has the particle that is activated by trypsin that is probably even before it emerges from one host and enters another. This is a fecal oral transmission virus and probably is already exposed to trypsin in the gut of the initial infected individual. It binds to the surface of um, the cell it's going to infect in the case of um, the virus infecting um, a person or a monkey, since this is a rhesus rotavirus, then um, it will bind to a small intestinal epithelial cell. Um, it's taken up by a process I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, that does not depend on familiar endocytic roots like clathrin-mediated uptake. Something triggers the conformational changes we've seen, so the membrane perforates, the particle escapes, and can start to make RNA. And so what can we learn from this sort of experiment about this sequence of events? We're just in the process of being able to try to do that. These experiments aren't uh, even yet published. But um, I think that uh, what I'd like to end on then is a series of questions that I think this kind of experiment can answer. And I hope that they will illustrate to you that by combining structural data with the kinds of, in this case, single virus particle imaging on living cells that take it, takes advantage of contemporary fluorescence microscopy, uh, we can begin to answer these sorts of questions. So the first question is about the engulfment. Is it simply what I like to call an autoendosome? That is, does the virus just wrap itself up in membrane? There are various reasons why we think that's at least a reasonable possibility. One is that the process is quite rapid and that it doesn't depend on any of the known cellular pathways. Within a minute or two, the virus particle is, um, is sequestered from agents like EDTA, which would take it apart by pulling calcium off, or antibodies that might bind to it. Um, a second question is about the membrane disruption that then occurs. Is the membrane disruption by VP5, this folding back that I showed you, purely mechanochemical, if you wish, as in fusion? Or are there other more, if you wish, detergent-like qualities of that, inter of that interaction? Does it indeed do what I pictured in the previous slide? Is there an extended intermediate? Does it remain anchored in the particle when it undergoes this whole process? What triggers it and when does VP7 come off? But as I think you can imagine we can begin by combining the powers of structure-based mutation and design of constrained or altered proteins with recoding and with the direct visualization particle by particle of this entry process to answer some of these questions. And so in conclusion, let me simply acknowledge the large number of people who have participated in this work. Um, I should um, acknowledge both people in my own laboratory as well as in collaborating laboratories. And let me just name the specific collaborators uh, with whom uh, the work has been carried out. 
Phil Dormitzer, who began as a member of our laboratory and I then have collaborated with him extensively um, since uh, he established an independent research program. Nico Gregoriev at Brandeis, one of the pioneers of the sorts of um, cryo-EM analysis that I described briefly to you. Tom Kirschhausen, whose work on live cell imaging and whose development of technologies has allowed us to do the experiments I just described. And Dick Bellamy uh, at the University of Auckland, who first got me interested in rotavirus in the first place. And thank you. <laughs>